At the outset, I would like to offer my humble pranams at the lotus feet of our most beloved Bhagwan. Dear viewers, this talk is based on one of the several I gave during my recent tour of New Zealand and Australia, about which I am sure you have heard. Uh, many followers of Radio Sai wanted copies of those talks, but uh, unfortunately, arranging that is somewhat cumber proved to be somewhat cumbersome. I am instead re-recording those talks, at least some of them, in a manner that would be suited for a wider audience. I hope the outcome would be satisfactory and also useful to you. <clears throat> okay, let me get started. During the time he was with us physically, Swami delivered thousands of discourses. However, the central objective of almost all the discourses was always the same. And what was that objective? It was to make us, one, realize that all humans are embodiments of the divine, and two, that life has to be a journey back to God. Now, over decades, Swami used a variety of strategi strategies and approaches to convey this core message. One of these was to use a set of phrases, three, two words or three words. This particular talk is based on one such phrase set. Now, during the last few years, Swami often used a triad of phrases that were made up of three key words. They are Daiva Preeti, Papa Bhiti, and Sanganiti. For the record, I should mention that Swami used the same triad during the mid-90s also. I remember that. Now, Swami always found a way of zooming in on this latest triad of His and stressing repeatedly those three keywords, three or four keywords, and uh, making sure that we understood that these words ought to be the lodestar of our lives. Now, in this talk, I would like to explain what the phrases Deva Preeti, Papa Bhiti, and Sanganiti mean, and how they are important for shaping our lives. Let me begin with the meaning of these three words. As you saw in the slide that was just flashed, Deva Preeti means love for God, Papa Bhiti means fear of sin, and Sanganiti means morality in society. Swami said that if Daiva Preeti or love for God and Papa Bhiti or fear of sin exist in our hearts, then Sanganiti or morality in society would follow automatically. Considering that morality in society is now what we lack very sorely, it is obvious that we should give some attention to the topic on which I have chosen to speak today. Let us begin by trying to first understand what Deva Preeti and Papa Bhiti really mean, and then examine how together they can lead to Sanganiti or morality in society. As I told you, Deva Preeti means love for God. We all think we understand what loving God means. Now, do we really understand that? Is it all that simple? For example, we all talk of God, but do we know who is God, what is God, and where is this God? Now, in this context, I must recall a talk given by a teacher many years ago as a precursor to a divine discourse by Bhagwan. In his talk, this teacher asked precisely the questions I mentioned just now. He asked, who is God, where is God, and what is God? And when Swami began to speak, he summarily dismissed all these questions and said, there is only God and nothing else but God. In fact, everything is God. That's what Swami said. It was electrifying to hear those words. But let me be frank. I don't think anyone in the audience that day understood what Swami was saying. For his part, Swami tried very hard to explain what he meant. And he did this in many ways, giving so many examples. In fact, not only in that discourse, but in many other discourses. 
I have often seen Swami while delivering a discourse. You know, he would simply hold up the small tumbler plate, a small silver plate covering the tumbler that contained drinking water meant for him. He will hold the plate and say, this plate is God. That was, of course, difficult for us to accept, but that's what he said. Next, he would hold the tumbler itself and say, this tumbler is also God. And after that, it would be t- the turn of the mic in front of him. He would point to the mic and s- say, Swami would say, this microphone is God. And so on it would go like that. That pillar is God, this table is God, and so on and so on. When we heard Swami saying all those things, we just listened. Later on, all that would just evaporate away since all of us are used to thinking of God in very different ways. In short, these teachings made very little impression on most of us. And we would end up saying, I am here, God is there, and He is different from me. We would all swear that Swami was God. There was no doubt about that. But it stopped right there and didn't go any further. No matter how many times Swami said it, we could never see God everywhere except in Swami's form. In short, for almost all of us, omnipresence was just a word, and it hardly meant what Swami said it ought to. And that really is where all our problems start. For more than a decade, I used to teach what was known as an awareness course. Indeed, some of you may recall, I even gave a series of musing talks based on that course. And in my class, I would draw what I would call the golden triangle. Now, in the slide that you just saw, you saw the triangle was depicted. The triangle shows the three entities that are central to every individual. First, there is God. Then there is the individual. And finally, there are society and nature clubbed together. God, of course, is connected to the individual. And that is the first point we must note. Next, Since we are a part of society, we have an obvious link with society. Likewise, since we are a part of nature, we obviously have a link with nature also. Finally, where did this nature come from? Nature came from God, and so that link between God and nature, which you saw in the triangle, also makes sense. Now comes the question, what about God and society? And here I would like to quote the first line of Purusha Suktam, which is a Vedic chant that is often chanted at the mandir. In fact, Swami himself quote that uh, first line and say, society itself is God. Now we can ask, how can society be God? Well, that's a simple way of understanding that. We say God is in every person. If that is the case, God must also be in a collection of people. And what is society other than a huge collection of all the people everywhere? That is what is human society, is it not? I hope that sheds some light on what I call the golden triangle and of which I showed you a slide a little earlier. Now I want to do something. Let me break up this triangle as shown in the next slide. What you saw in that slide is that the triangle is split or factorized into two pieces. The question is, what happens when the triangle is fractured in this manner? Well, suppose a person splits or his or her relationship with God and society in, that ma- in this manner, as shown in the slide. It then helps that individual to segment or compartmentalize life and have different rules for different segments. You may not understand what I am saying, but just bear with me and you will understand. Suppose you separate God from society and nature. The individual then can maintain a deep personal relationship with God on the one hand and a totally different relationship with everything else on the other. Now, this person may say, I love God, 
and they show my love for God by worshiping Him regularly via puja, doing namaz as prescribed, or going to church on Sundays and so on. Occasionally, I also make some donation to some charity or the other to underscore my love for God. But where society and nature are concerned, for me, God does not enter into that picture. In other words, by breaking up the triangle, golden triangle, we can comfortably lead a double life with a split personality, as it were. We become schizophrenic. All this is fine, but what has that got to do with Deva Preeti? Now, my answer is the following. If you split your attitude towards society and nature in this manner by taking God out of the picture, then what you describe as love for God does not amount to love for God. That is not Daiva Preeti. You may ask, then what is Daiva Preeti? To answer that question, we must now examine how a person with a split personality behaves when he or she goes out into society. Remember, the golden triangle has now been torn apart into two pieces. And as far as this person is concerned, society has no connection with God. And the same is true of nature. And that disconnect immediately gives a lot of room for flexibility for interpreting one's actions. Here's an example. Take killing. We all know that killing is no-no. In fact, Moses says, thou shall not kill. And all the religions say the same. But once God is kept out of society, there is room for tweaking Moses. Thus, a member of Al-Qaeda says, yes, Quran says I must not kill. But I can kill an infidel since he does not believe in Allah. In fact, it is my duty. So this is the way we can introduce false logic. And that is, becomes possible once you take God out of society. And once you take God out of society, you can claim all kinds of flexibility to interpret morality, what God wants, etc., in your own sweet way. And when this happens everywhere, the net result is social aberration, which could even be extreme. The take-home lesson is that Daiva Preeti means much more than a personalized love for God exhibited merely by a worship of idols, going to temples, and so on. I don't want you to get the impression that I am frowning upon worship rituals, etc. Not at all. Rather, if you really want to worship God that way, then you must be fully immersed in it to the extent possible. Here's an example of what I mean. And I take this from what Swami has said occasionally in some of his discourses. As many of you might be aware, Tirupati is a famous shrine in South India. Now, the presiding deity in Tirupati is Lord Venkateswara, who is very widely worshipped. The belief is that the Lord of Tirupati fulfills all the wishes of all the devotees. That's why he's so popular. Now, devotees have been visiting Tirupati for over a hundred, thousand years, maybe even more. But unlike in the past, these days, it's relatively easy to go to the shrine city and visit the temple. There's a good road, there are buses, and if you can afford it, you can even get yourself a luxury limousine, completely air-conditioned. Now, in the Gita, Bhagavad Gita, the Lord describes the kind of devotees who flock to Him. What are the types of devotees who flock to God? There are four kinds. The first kind is the type of devotee who has a lot of difficult problems, personal problems. Then there are those devotees who want many of their desires fulfilled. People always have desires, and they look to God to fulfill desires. So the people in trouble, people with desires. Then the third category is genuine seekers who are thirsting for enlightenment. And finally, there are the realized souls who want nothing but just to be with God. Tirupati attracts all the four kinds of devotees described by Lord Krishna. Now, as is to be expected in this Kali age, it is the type 1 and type 2 devotees who form 99.9% .9 of the crowds. Now, Lord Venkateswara is particularly popular with the business crowd, especially of Bombay city, which is now called Mumbai. Bombay businessmen 
referred to Lord Venkateswara as Balaji. I don't know the reason for this. And because they have to worship him frequently, they have even built for Balaji a branch office in Bombay city, close to the business sector. This temple is called Phanaswadi Temple, and I've been there a couple of times. But at times, these Bombay tycoons want to visit the head office in Tirupati, either to give special thanks or offer special prayers for the success of an important deal in the making. So what does this tycoon do? Along with his secretary, he first flies to an airport close to Tirupati. From there, he goes by an air-conditioned limo to the temple up the hill. It takes about three hours or so. At the temple, there are always huge crowds queuing up for entry. The tycoon secretary has already bought two expensive tickets for priority darshan. So these two people are ushered in close to the deity without any hassle. The businessman stands for a couple of minutes in front of the idol, prays, and then comes out. He gets into his waiting taxi and drives back to the airport. Swami says, all the way from the airport to the temple, this man was discussing only business matters with his secretary. And all the way back, the topic of discussion was the same. Throughout this trip of several hours from Mumbai back to Mumbai, this man spent barely two minutes thinking of God. That's all. Two minutes. Can he call himself a devotee? Can this devotion be called Deva Priti? Swami says, no, not at all. And then he adds, back in the old days, when there was no road, that this was so up to about 1930 or so. That is when the road was first built. Not a very good road, but now it's a very good road. Back in those days, people had to actually walk several kilometers, climbing and crossing seven hills. There are seven hills there. And that's why those that hill range is called Saptagiri. It was very taxing because in the very early stages of the climb, it is very steep. And back then there was no proper road or footpath for climbing. It was just a very roughly paved pathway. And yet people spent hours and hours climbing. And all along they would chant, Go in the, go in the, go in the, go in the. That is how they used to climb. I've seen it myself. That climb was a true pilgrimage. They chanted the name of God and while taking every step. And the, their thought was all on the joy they would have when they finally had the darshan of the Lord at the end of the pilgrimage. To put it differently, every bit of that climb was an act of worship. And it was totally God-centric. Can one say that of the Mumbai tycoon who gave God only two minutes in his 10-hour lightning trip to Bombay, uh, to Tirupati and back? Obviously not. The moral of the story that Swami occasionally narrated is quite clear. Daiva Preeti is not to be certified by us. Rather, it is God who must say, Son, I am pleased with your devotion and love for me. So we must get that clearly. So for us, the question now becomes, how do we fail in this Deva Preeti business? Where lies the failure? The short answer is, that failure occurs when deliberately or otherwise, we break the golden triangle. So what must we do to prevent that from happening? Two things. First, we must see God in ourselves. Then we must see God in society. And finally, we must see God in nature. Then the triangle remains intact. I hope you follow that. Now, we must not only keep the triangle intact, we must try to shrink the triangle till it becomes a point. Okay? Once the triangle becomes a point, at that stage, everything merges and there is only God. And is that not what Swami told us? There is only God, nothing except God. 
if we live our lives properly, we can actually experience that oneness. But how does one prevent the breakup of the triangle? And how does one make that triangle shrink? There are two questions that we have to now answer. And that is where this magic formula of Daiva Preeti, Papa Bhiti and Sangha Niti comes into the picture. You may not understand this, so let me proceed further. Just to recap, so far I have discussed what is the meaning of Daiva Preeti and I explained why our love for God cannot be compartmentalized. Such a compartmentalization happens when the golden triangle is allowed to be fractured. Now, let me move on to the second phrase in my list, namely Papa Bhiti. As I told you, I have stopped with the Deva Priti, now I am going to Papa Bhiti. As I told you, Papa Bhiti means fear of sin. Swami says, people are often told that they must fear God. He says, this is nonsense. People should not fear God. People go on describing themselves by saying, I'm a God-fearing person and so on. This is absolute nonsense, says Swami. Swami says, listen, God is your only friend and also the very best friend you can think of. Why should you be afraid of a friend? What you should be afraid of is sin. Instead of fearing sin, you are fearing God. This is completely inverted and totally wrong. And it is because you invert, you get into all sorts of problems. Now, what is happening now is, man is thinking of God only occasionally when he has some problems or some desires that need to be fulfilled. God is not a medic who fixes your problem or an ATM who gives you all your cash or uh, grants all your wish. God is your friend, and so you should not be afraid of God. Sin is your real enemy, and it is sin that you should be mortally afraid of. Now, the question arises, what is this sin that Swami is talking about, and how does one fear it? Let us deal with those issues. Let me go back to Swami's remark that everything is God and that there is nothing except God. If that is the case, how can we make our own rules and say society has nothing to do with God and then cause all kinds of harm to society? We just can't do that. Indeed, we should not do that. But you know what? Lately, people have been doing exactly that and with increasing frequency. Let me consider a classic example. For over a century, it was tacitly accepted that schools, colleges, and universities exist for serving society and for doing larger public good. In practice, this meant that the fees were never exorbitant. From somewhere between 1975 and 1980 onwards, we began to hear a new phrase, for-profit schools, for-profit colleges, for-profit universities, and so on. This practice started in America and the United Kingdom, where a new market philosophy took over. Basically, the mantra that was constantly repeated was, and this was repeated by market-friendly forces, leave everything to the market. Market knows best. And market will always deliver the goods. Faith, place faith on the market and leave everything to the market. This was the mantra that people are fed constantly. And they were totally brainwashed into embracing this new ideology. All this was very cleverly done. And people's minds were manipulated to overlook the fact that market was quietly invading the domain of public good. And as a result, today, things have gone berserk. Now, fees, school fees, college fees, university fees that once used to be reasonable have now skyrocketed since education is now a business that is supposed to make profits. 
and to meet the expenses students in america have begun to borrow left and right in the hope that they can repay the loans one day when they have a good job and the next slide will show you a very troublesome graph what is striking here is that the household debt in america is less than the student debt which is not only disturbing but also very dangerous that is what markets have done to education they happened first in america and now it's happening even in india where education was once worshiped as goddess saraswati i don't want to get into the uh, details of that painful story about student student debt in america and how it is harming that society my point is slightly different it is beginning to happen even in india and destroying even this society see when swami established his university in 1981 there were only nine private universities in india do you know how many private universities there are in india today as i speak over 100 how come there has been a mushroom of so many private universities because education has now become good good business and in india where schools and colleges were regarded as were once regarded as the temples of saraswati people now merrily run for profit schools for profit colleges and also for profit universities likewise healthcare which was traditionally considered as a service meant for public good it has now become a for profit industry now my question is why are these aberrations happening in the last 20 30 years they are happening because almost all of us have stopped seeing god in society remember the fracture of the golden triangle if we think that god exists only in idols and temples and forget that he also pervades the whole of society then i'm afraid we are asking for trouble and we can get that trouble in plenty as we are seeing presently in other words daiva preeti includes loving god who pervades the whole of society and loving god in society translates as serving society and seeing god in society why even while we serve i don't know whether it's clear i hope it is but even if it is not i trust it will become clearer as i proceed okay i have dealt with deva preeti and papa beeti to some extent and also discussed god in society let me now turn to nature because the golden triangle graphic which i showed you society was clubbed with nature we all know that nature is a manifestation of god so we often used to say nature is the dress of god yet if you look around today people are increasingly acting as if there is no link between god and nature this is both absurd as well as wrong i recall a discourse that swami gave to boys many many years ago in trai vrindavan and i happened to be present there in that discourse swami said foreigners refer to indians as primitives since indians worship the earth the trees the mountains rivers snakes and even snakes okay indians are supposed to be primitive now what about the westerners who decry indians as primitive they wipe out entire forests they quarry away entire mountains and they deplete the seas of their fish they pollute air massively they pollute water massively and they are even polluting land with their landfills swami then asked who is more civilized the one who respects nature or the one who ravages it now the answer is clear of course and now in ancient times people everywhere not only in india but all over the world intuitively revered nature in various ways today 
thanks to the breakup of the golden triangle, which each one of us is wrecking up, even in India, things are far from okay. Let me make my point by showing you a slide. The slide that you just saw shows people gathered at the banks of the river Ganges and offering prayers in the evening. This ritual is known as Ganga Aarti, and some of you might be aware that this ritual is being performed because the river Ganges is considered to be very sacred and uh, worshipped as Ganga Mata or Mother Ganges. This sort of ritual goes on all over the length of the Ganges, from almost the source to the place where it meets the ocean. This happens every day all over the place. And that is understandable. But you just wait. Take a look. At the next slide. In this slide, you see the same Ganges being polluted. This pollution is of a low level, if I may say so. What you see floating is stuff that people bring when a funeral is performed. Now, in India, especially in North India, it is very common practice to cremate corpses on river banks. And Ganges is naturally a very highly favored cremation spot. And so people bring all sorts of things for performing the cremation. And while the cremation is going on, after a while they draw the, drag the body and let it float in the river. And all the stuff that they bring, like mats, pots and so on, are also dumped in the river. That's how you get the pollution you saw in that slide. Take a look at the next slide, which is far more shocking. Now, in this slide, the sewage from a small town is pouring directly into the river. Now, imagine that. On one side, we hail the river as mother and offer worship daily. And on the other side, we pollute the same river 24 hours a day, merrily, without any second thought, how? By allowing sewage to get into that river. And this is happening all throughout the length of the Ganges, which is a very long river. Think of the havoc that is produced. Think of how much we damage that river. Kill the fish in it. Kill the plants that grow under the, so, the water and so on. And all this is the result of a split attitude to society and God. So much for how we limit Daiva Preeti by compartmentalization. It's time that I say something more about fear of sin. I told you, we must not fear God, but fear sin. So the question now becomes, what exactly is meant by the word sin? People normally think of sin in terms of don't do rules. Moses gave his famous Ten Commandments, about which I'm, I'm sure you know. Moses' rule book says, Thou shall not kill, which means killing is a sin. Thou shall not steal, which means stealing is a sin. Thou shall not commit adultery, which means committing adultery is a sin, and so on. So people said, sin is all those things one is not supposed to do, as said in the rule book. But this list is not enough. Since these lists do not really address the issue of defining what exactly is sin, they simply tell you, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But suppose somebody says, what exactly is sin? I want to have a definition. Give me a simple one. But let me tell you, there is a simple definition. In my view, sin is anything that would cause pain to Swami. What does that mean? Well, to understand that, let us recall what Swami often told his listeners. He used to say, if you remember, I am in you, I am above you, I am below you, I am around you, I am behind you, and so on. When Swami said that, it automatically implies that God is in fact present in everyone 
and in everything around us, from the ant to the cosmos. So you see, God is in all. And the slide that you just saw was meant to illustrate that God is immanent in everything in the universe, both animate and inanimate, from the smallest to the largest. Remember the phrase, Anoraniyan Mahatomahiyan? What does that say? It says that God is in the smallest of the small, namely the atom, and also in the largest of the large, namely the cosmos. Incidentally, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa used to say, Tiger also is God, but that does not mean you go near the tiger and pat it like you would like to do to a cat. And if you did that, you would be asking for trouble, especially if it happens to be the tiger's lunch hour. The point I am making is that since God is in all, it, it means that if we hurt someone, we are really causing pain to Swami. Because Swami is in everyone, in everything, from the smallest of the small to largest of the large. And by, by way of stressing this, Swami often used to say, Sarva Jeeva Namaskaram Kesavam Pradigachati. What does that mean? It means that if you offer salutations to any being, that salutation really goes to God. Swami also said, Sarva Jeeva Tiraskaram Kesavam Pradigachati. What does this mean? It means that if you abuse anyone, that abuse also goes to God. Just think of how often people abuse each other. Would they do so if they really appreciated the omnipresence of God? By the way, please remember that hurt can be caused not only with sticks, knives, swords, guns and bombs, but also via thought and word. At this stage, a question can be asked. What if someone is trying to hurt me? Am I not allowed to protect myself? Are we not entitled to self-protection? Well, that's a good question, and I shall answer this question at two levels. To start with, let me suppose you have full faith in Swami, and thus full faith in His love and nothing else. No, no, you don't, you don't compromise on that. You have total faith. In such a case, your love for Swami would act as a shield and protect you. Swami often talked about this and used to say, you know, in the, back in the old days, Rishis used to go to the forest to meditate. The forests were full of snakes, scorpions, and wild animals of all sorts like bears, tigers, and even lions. However, when they came near a rishi who was in meditation, they would become gentle and quietly move away. The aura from the love of rishi created a safety zone, and that is how the rishis were protected, by the love that radiated from them. So even wild animals have become quiet and simply go away. I know many of you would not buy that, and so let me narrate a real incident. Many years ago, during a trial session, Swami asked the late Mr. Hal Honig of New York to speak to the boys. I was present in the audience, and this is what Hal Honig said as a part of his speech. Following Swami's advice, Hal Honig took to seva very seriously. Thus, he often made food packets and distributed the packets to the needy in a very famous slum of New York, in the northern part of the city, known as Harlem. Today, of course, Harlem has changed a lot. But back then, it was a very notorious slum. Not very far from, by the way, from Columbia University, which is very famous. Now, one day after completing his seva, Hal Honig was returning by the subway. By this time, it was night. When the train stopped at a particular station, a big burly man entered the compartment in which Hal was sitting. The moment the doors closed and the train started moving, this man pulled out a switchblade knife and began extracting money from the passengers. Slowly, the man started coming close to where Hal was sitting. 
Hal was scared. However, his heart told him that he deep inside Swami was present in that bad flow also. So with firm faith, Hal began telling himself, Swami, since you are in that person also, I am not going to be afraid of him, but I am going to show love to him. I know you who are hiding in him would respond appropriately. This might look like a kind of auto-suggestion or make-believe, but anyway, that's what Hal Honig did. And when the man came near to Hal, Hal smiled, held out a food packet he had. He had some packets still with him. He held it out and said to that man, Sir, please can I offer you some peanut butter sandwiches and chocolate cookies? The man just stared for a minute. Then he stretched out his hand, accepted the packet that was offered, sat next to Hal Honig and started eating. The man ate, finished eating, and by this time, the train slowed down as preparatory to stopping at the next station. The man then got up and started moving towards the door. Halfway, he stopped, turned, looked at Hal, smiled and said, thank you, and then just moved on. Now, here was this so-called bad guy who bothered all the others but reacted differently to Hal. Why? Because Hal had offered love and he got back love. Now, this is level one where you have total faith in love and in Swami. If you have such faith, it will always pay off, even in this Kali age, and that is pretty reassuring. But the fact is that all of us cannot be like that. In that case, self-defense is warranted up to a point. After all, let us not forget that Lord Krishna was actually on the battlefield giving moral support to Team Dharma in an actual war. I have said many things thus far, and that might be a bit confusing to you, so maybe I should take a brief pause and take stock. We started with Daiva Priti and learned that since everything is God and only God, it is not very meaningful to squeeze God out of everything and confining Him to only the puja room or the church or the mosque or the gurudwara or the synagogue or whatever it is. It is true, such a fragmentation may give the mind a lot of elbow room to manipulate in the world. But that does not amount to Deva Preeti. I agree we cannot develop total Deva Preeti on day one. Our perceptions would necessarily be limited at the start. However, we have to try to live by some important rules. And the first rule is we must make a conscious and constant effort to expand the domain of God. We shouldn't see God only in the puja room. We should begin to see him in society and nature as well. In practice, this means always keep the golden triangle in mind. Next, I talked about sin and said that sin is an act that would cause pain to Swami. Now, you know, Swami loved us. And if he did something that was not nice, Swami would feel hurt. Here is my son. I am giving so much love and he is going and acting in this manner. Every father would feel that way. So it is not wrong to imagine that Swami would feel that way to us because he really acted like our father and mother. Did he not? Would not a mother be pained if her child goes the wrong way? Would not a father feel that way? So we must be very careful that we do not do anything that would cause pain to Swami whom we can regard either as the mother or the father. And remember that act can be in thought, word, and deed. Now comes an important question. How to avoid sin? The answer is, when we act in relation to anything in the world, the first question we have to ask is, would this act cause any pain to that entity? 
would it damage or harm that entity would it harm any others also in any way these are the kind of questions we should ask and what this tells us is in short that before we act we must do some introspection and we must not only think with our mind but check with our conscience if we constantly check with our conscience we would always remember that swami is in every rock he is in every mountain he is in every water river animal tree forest person so on whatever you think whatever you see wherever it is swami is there if we never forget that god is immanent in everything everywhere all the time it would be very difficult for us to commit sin because we know that if we do anything to hurt anything that would hurt swami this is how we put the rule into practice at this stage i would like to make a reference to what happened some time ago in the state of orissa in india this state orissa is now been has now been renamed odisha and sadly it is one of the most backward states in india it has many tribes and recently one of these tribes attracted a lot of newspaper headlines because of a tr- struggle that this tribe was wage- waging with a very powerful multinational con- company interestingly this big powerful multinational happens to be named vedanta and its headquarters are in london now orissa is a state that is rich in minerals and understandably many big companies are engaged in huge mining operations there which of course stirs up the earth vedanta which is deep into mining had bought a vast lo- tract of land that included a very big mountain it so happened that this particular mountain was part of a range worshiped by a tribe and that tribe strongly protested about this purchase because they were scared that the mountain was becoming part of a company which would soon tear up the mountain for making money and the tribals were thinking our god is being stolen by the way the hills of tirupati have also been regarded as sacred by people for thousands of years so if tribes worship mountains that is not at all unusual at least in india the tribes worship the mountains because the mountains and the forests on the mountains sustain them in many ways who sustains you becomes your god no normally when there are tribal protests for something or the other they are put down and they seldom attract outside attention this time a very powerful ngo which is actively interest, engaged in protecting the environment stepped in to support the tribe not only did the ngo elevate the issue so as to capture national attention but they also took on vedanta and this caught the attention of the british press and soon there was much public support in many parts of the country also and also in britain for a little known tribe in orissa actually some of the members of the tribe were flown to london so that they could directly speak to the shareholders of vedanta and also address the world press now vedanta protested and said look we are taking away only one mountain there are five or six others plenty of god left for you the tribe said today it is one mountain tomorrow you will take away the entire mountain range we can't allow that money is very powerful and it will always keep changing its mind some people said listen stop all this nonsense if you go if mining is started it will lead to jobs it will lead to development it will lead to wealth why are you protesting yes mining some supposed to do all that but you know it seldom does good to the locals anywhere in the world maybe a few people benefit but by and large it is the big companies that profit not the locals at least it is so in india in south america and also in africa i believe i don't know about other parts of the world now coming back to this case vedanta was least bothered that these mountains were worshiped by the tribes i don't know how this tussle ended 
But what I am interested in is the fact that for these tribes, mountain was caught. The executives of Vedanta, however, did not see God in the mountains. They saw money in the mountains by the minerals that were in the mountain. And for them, minerals was good business and minerals make money. So, out of the three faces, namely Deva Priti and Papa Bhiti and Sangha Niti, I have dealt with two, namely Deva Priti and Papa Bhiti. Now comes the hard part, Sangha Niti. And let me say why it is the hard part. People normally say, look, spirituality is an individual question. Where does society come into this? Yes, spirituality is an individual quest. However, that does not mean one must shut out the world while trying to progress spiritually. That is what many people imagine, but that's not correct. I make a special mention of this because people often hold sadhana camps, most of which focus on introspection and less on self-improvement through service to society, seeing God in those who are served. In this context, it is pertinent to recall an amusing story that Swami occasionally used to tell to the students. The story goes like this. One day, Sage Narada, I hope you know who he is, he shows up in Vaikuntam, the abode of Lord, Lord Narayana. Now, seeing the sage, the Lord welcomed him with a big smile and said, Narada, how nice to see you. I haven't seen you for a long time. Where were you? I suppose you were touring the three worlds singing my glory. Wasn't that what you were doing? Narada shook his head and replied, No, my Lord, I went to the forest to meditate. Showing surprise, the Lord asked, Meditation, Narada? What for? Narada replied, Lord, I get angry very easily. I wanted to overcome my anger, and that is why I went to the forest to meditate. Really? Do you think you have now overcome your anger? Lord, I am happy to say I have indeed overcome my anger. Then Narayana smiled and said, Narada, that is great. But you know, anger is not all that easy to overcome. It's pretty difficult. Narada said, Lord, I assure you, I succeeded in controlling my anger. Then Lord said, well, in that case, Narada, I must congratulate you. Then, stroking his chin, the Lord continued, but you know, Narada, if you ask me, I feel that anger is not so easy to conquer. Hearing this, Narada becomes upset and says, Lord, you seem to be doubting what I am saying. Narayana hastily replied, no, 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 Arata, it's not like that. You know, all I'm saying is that I've seen many people try so far. They all tried to conquer anger, but you know what? So far, I have hardly seen anyone control anger. It's very difficult, you know. By now, Narada was losing his composure and cool. Raising his voice, he says, Lord, if you don't believe me, then why don't you say so openly? Why all this roundabout talk? Narayana replies, Hold on, Narada. It looks like you are getting angry. No, I am not, shouts Narada. Speaking softly and gently, the Lord then says, Narada, I do not doubt your keenness to overcome anger. Anger is a dangerous quality, and the sooner one gets rid of it, the better. All I was trying to hint at is, that anger cannot be overcome by withdrawing to the forest. Narada now becomes silent. After a while, he asks, Lord, what exactly is wrong about going to the forest and meditating there to overcome anger? Smiling, the Lord says, Narada, you are all alone in the forest while meditating. Tell me, who was there to get angry with? Perplexed, Narada asked, Lord, what then must I do? Lord replies, That's simple, Narada. You must stay in the world. And whenever you look like getting angry, you must control your mind in such a manner that anger is subdued. But Lord, that is tough. 
the Lord says, I agree. If you try sincerely, you might even succeed because I would come to your help. The basic moral of that story that Swami told is that negative tendencies must be fought head on by staying in the world and confronting them directly and not by shutting oneself out artificially. As I often used to tell my students, if you develop a new tire for a car, the best way to test it is to fit the tire onto a car and drive the car on the toughest and the worst roads you can find. And if you ask me, I would say, come to India, we have the best roads for tire testing. In brief, to get back to what I was saying, sadhana is a process where the mind is let loose in the world, but the break of conscience within is used to control the mind. Uh, in the slide that you just saw, what I just said is illustrated by showing a car going on a very bumpy road. Okay, two questions remain. The first is, how do we manage to control the senses in the mind? And the second is, how does my developing love for God and fear of sin promote morality in society? I agree that Deva Preeti and Papa Beeti will do good to me, but how about my community? That I don't understand. Okay, let us try to find the answer to these two questions. It turns out that we do not, do not have to look very far for the answers because Swami has most kindly given us the answers and also set up a pathway to implement his advice. In 1965, Swami set up the Sri Satisai Seva organization and I am sure you all know about it. I am sure you also know its motto is Love all, serve all. But how many of you have read the fine print? I don't think many have. And so let me lay out that fine print for you. Start with the love all part of the advice, love all, serve all. This means you must actually love every single person you love. Suppose, say, there is food distribution for the poor, Nara and Seva as it is referred to. What happens? Well, food gets distributed, but often this food distribution is done like a chore that must be completed. And that applies to all aspects of the distribution. That sort of thing is fine for an organization like, say, the Red Cross, for example. I'm not trying to demean the Red Cross. It's a good NGO whose objective is to help the needy. And that exactly is what their volunteers and employees go about doing. Size save organization is completely different. Yes, at the operational level, it too, its members too engage in serva, seva or service. However, there is an important distinction. And that distinction lies in the objectives that Swami laid out for the organization. He said, your first objective in joining the organization and serving must be to spiritually improve yourself. And next, when you serve, it must bring happiness to the person who is served. Now notice that the person who is given, doing the service is given priority and not the one who is being served. This is just the opposite of what happens in the normal service organization. You may be shocked and even shake your head. But wait, there is a reason why Swami is implicitly laid out this order. Swami says, remember, you are supposed to develop true love for God. Can you really love Swami if you have ego? Clearly not. So, before you set out for service, you must try to make sure that ego is controlled to the ex extent possible. Why? Because if one has ego, one cannot offer true love to the person who is being served. Remember, so love all. So when you serve, you must love all. And you must, you can offer love only when there is no ego. At least it is minimized. Now recall what the Hal Honig story. What did Hal do first? He first prayed to Swami 
and then try to see Swami in the tough and mean-looking guy. Can we do that? Most of us would not be able to see Swami in a thug. Instead, we would be scared stiff even by a mere look at such a person. Hal chose to look, look deep inside that person and address the Atma within that person instead of being guided by what his senses and his mind told him. Hal said to himself, This man may look like and even act like a thug. However, I also know that Swami is deep inside that person and so I am going to address the Swami inside the person instead of the body that the person is wearing, as a, that, that Atma is wearing as a dress in this case. It was through such reasoning that Hal offered food packet with love and care to the thug instead of brusquely saying, hey, mister, take these sandwiches and get lost or something like that in order to avoid getting hurt. In brief, service must be performed both to limit one's own ego as well as to bring happiness to the person served. Someone said ego means edging God out. Now, that's a good phrase to remember, especially because ego is often very much in play even during Sai Seva. I have seen so many Sai bosses throwing their weight around their juniors while Seva. Some of them even want service for themselves rather than those who, for those who want to be served. In this context, I recall what one person who was sent by Swami to Gujarat during the massive earthquake of 2001 told me. When Swami's huge convoy of trucks carrying relief material reached Gujarat, the international NGOs were already there in droves with their service trucks. The gentleman told me that he saw a volunteer in one of these NGO trucks picking up blankets and throwing them to people on the road, expect, expecting them to pick up the blankets as they fell on the road. Apparently, one man who was standing on the road shouted back, Hey, you big shot in the truck. You know what? Till yesterday, we were all officers with our own apartments and possessions. Just because the quake has destroyed them, uh, all our houses, you do not have to treat us like beggars. That one little incident, which, by the way, gets enacted all the time all over the world, teaches us a lot. It explains why, it explains why Swami always advised, after the service is over, ask yourself, to what extent did that service I did just now help me to bring down my ego? How many, do, how many people do such a self-check every time they go out for seva? How many are even aware that such a self-check is needed? I hope you get the point. Let me now move on to another point. Okay, I do this seva, but how on earth does it promote morality in society? Here is how. You know, so many people come to Swami's hospital for getting treated, thousands of them every year. When they first come, they come often in desperation. Most of them know nothing about Sai Baba. All they know is that he has got a hospital. All they knew when they came to Swami's hospital was that this was a place where they would be treated free. They came and they were not only treated free, but also offered love and kindness. There was a big that was a big surprise for most of the patients. The important thing was they were not pushed around as poor invariably are. The love shown to them always touched them. And you know what? It lit the lamp of love in many of them and made them also to take to Sai Seva. Let me give just one example. This happened in 1994 when a man named George Becke from Kerala came to Swami's hospital in Puttaparthi. This man, George Becke, had gone from Kerala to work in the Bahrain in the Gulf. And there he developed a serious heart problem and was asked to go back to India for treatment. In India, he went from hospital to hospital and everywhere he was told, 
you need a major surgery and it's costly do you have the money george did not and so he became depressed that was when someone told him about swami's hospital in puttaparthi now george was a christian by birth but since kerala had turned to marxist rule george had embraced marxism and become an atheist George not only did not believe in god but he also did not trust spiritual organizations organizations including christian organizations thus at first he rejected the idea of going to puttaparthi because the hospital was employ- uh, established by a swami ji according to him but his pain and suffering was so much that he said let me go and have a check up and see how things are there so he came to puttaparthi for a check up and everything he saw stunned him first no one asked him any question about his beliefs next everyone was kind to him and thirdly no one talked to him about money this is a very strange experience instead george was told you see you have this problem it can be treated so this is the day come then and come for surgery and please come two days in advance and bring an attendant with you he came on the appointed day got himself admitted and underwent the surgery and after about 10 days or so when he was discharged he was a completely transformed person swami had now become god for him and he swore he would do seva himself that's astonishing man was an atheist he did not believe in god he comes he gets treated and all of a sudden he starts saying i know god that is for me and i am going to serve him and you know what from that day george comes four times every year to puttaparthi two trips are for doing seva and every time he comes for seva he stays for 15 days two weeks the other two trips swami george makes he comes as a devotee just for darshan he comes once at onam time and again during the birthday season so you see when seva is done the right way it can become transformative there can be no question about that in short swami set up the seva organization both for improving the individual and also for spreading values across the society and remember all this is possible only if every single person becomes passionately committed to deva priti and that is not possible without papa bhiti or a mortal fear of sin to sum up sai seva is supposed to take you inside via the outside the question can be asked okay i must diminish my ego and seva is the best method of achieving that but why should i serve in the organization i can serve in a strictly personal capacity what's wrong with that actually there is nothing wrong with doing individual seva god loves that too in fact many lawyers and doctors do that lawyers do pro bono work doctors treat patients free of cost and thousands of people benefit by such individual seva no question about that but swami's point is different he said if you do seva collectively then there is an amplification factor and what it means is that the whole can be much more than the sum of the parts we all know this from algebra a plus b whole squared is not just a squared plus b squared but there is an additional 2ab factor the slide that you saw illustrates what i mean if i remember correctly swami actually referred to this a plus b squared formula on one occasion to stress the fact that there is an enhancement when people come together another way of looking at the effect of collectivism is to consider an orchestra a symphony orchestra has many musicians who play different instruments furthermore usually not all inst- musicians play at the same time and it's only sometime they come together for example 
when the flutist is playing, the violins would be silent and so on. Nevertheless, if you take everything together, the effect on the listener of the totality of the music played by the orchestra in perfect harmony can be very, very, uh, I would say, exhilarating and can produce ecstasy. That is, it is this playing together in harmony, perfect harmony, everybody doing the right thing at the right time, that what ultimately leads to the grandeur of the concert as a whole. So, when we serve, we must imagine ourselves to be the members of an orchestra and make our service have the quality of divine music. Musicians in an orchestra consult the musical score in front of them. They also look at the conductor who conducts. Our music must be etched in our minds. And our, as for the conductor, we must look for him in our hearts. Today, society is caught up in innumerable problems. But it is unable to solve them. It's very interesting that humans who are able to deal with difficult problems like smallpox are not able to deal with certain other problems. By the way, youngsters of today may not know what smallpox is. It's a deadly virus that used to kill people in millions, and I literally mean millions. Smallpox was prevalent when I was young, and at that time all babies had to have smallpox vaccination. It was mandatory. If one traveled abroad, one had to have a special vaccination done by a World Health Organization appointed doctor. Moreover, the vaccine number, etc., batch number, etc., had to be entered in a special international health card. Upon arrival in any country, this health care card, which was yellow in color, had to be produced along with the passport. I have done it many times. Today, there is no smallpox. It has been eliminated totally and there is no need to carry a health card. But you know what? Man is not able to many, eliminate many problems. Here is a sample. Now in that slide that you just saw, Professor Jeffrey Sachs is listing some of the problems that he considered important. Actually, there are many more. And humans are not able to solve these problems because every one of these problems originates in the mind. The mind traps humans, and thus modern man is moving like a person who is caught up in a maze. You saw two slides. Those slides illustrate modern man caught up in a maze and does not know how to come out. But you know something? A bird can never be trapped in a maze. And the reason for this is simple. The bird can just fly away, rising above the maze, as you see in the next slide. The take-home lesson from that slide that you just now saw is very clear. If we are to solve the problems of humanity, we must move to a higher plane, that is to say from the level of the mind to the level of the heart. And we must move in such a way that the change in us is able to transform others also. In 1968, there was a World Conference of Seva Organization. If I remember correctly, it was held in Bombay. And one of those who attended it was Charles Penn. Now, this Penn was an Australian who settled down in America just on the eve of the Second World War. He chanced to come across Kasturi's book on Swami and was immediately captivated by Swami and his teaching. He then began to meditate intensely, so intensely that he could pick up messages from Swami. In 1968, Penn was invited to speak at the conference, World Conference, and just before that, he got a message from Swami in his meditation. He confirmed with Swami that the message had in fact come from Bhagwan himself, and he then read out that message during the World Conference. The next slide shows a part of the message Swami sent to the World Conference.
No, that slide makes clear, does it not, that both you and I have a special task in today's world. If we agree that that is so, then by way of preparing ourselves for that special role, we must develop Daiva Preeti and also Papa Bhiti in the sense that I explained. If after having done so, we also cohere and develop synergy like the members of an orchestra do, then there cannot be any doubt that the problems of society will slowly get solved one by one. That is all I wish to say on this theme, Deva Preeti, Papa Bhiti and Sangeniti. I am really sorry that this talk became a bit long. I apologize for that. But then, you know, I had a duty to explain as clearly as I could Swami's teachings and exhortations. I sincerely thank you for your patience. And I hope you have been able to see this all the way up to this point. God bless you all. Offering this talk in the lotus feet of our most beloved Bhagwan.